we went over to the, the sort of the chapel by the office on my first day and it, it looked like California at first. Everyone was saying in the car, oh, this is like California. You know, there's nice trees and nice, nice houses. The office was in a really nice area. And then I got assigned to my first zone and we took a car ride down there. I don't even remember how long it was. I just remember that I couldn't understand anything. And it was in the middle of one of the poorest parts of the city. I mean, most of Interlagos is pretty poor, but I went to, to Grajau, which is a nice, a nice poor part on the south side of the city. And I just got there and it was completely different. It was all these half finished red brick houses and cement everywhere. And I just didn't understand how you were supposed to live because there was, you know, there was no carpet, there was no air conditioning, there was no, there was nothing familiar to me. It was just kind of a small little house behind a member's house. And my companion said, welcome. <laughs> it was exciting. Um, I was surprised at how much we walked. We walked a lot. And I, I did get blisters in the first couple, first week or so. But those went away fast. I was very surprised at how much we walked. And I was very surprised at, at how, how dense the city was. Like here we have a house, you know, there's a yard, there's a side yard, there's a backyard, there's space. There it's a house on top of a house that's next to a house that's next to another house that's inside another house that's behind a house. And it's just, it's just, there's so many people. You can go to the same house and see, and each family's gigantic. So you can go to the same house, you can meet their neighbor, you can meet their neighbor's neighbor, you can meet their cousin who happens to live behind them. You can meet their aunt and uncle who live upstairs. It's just so many people, so much potential. It was really cool. The Interlagos steak was one of the first steaks in Sao Paulo. It wasn't the first. First was the Sao Paulo steak, but it was one of the first ones as steaks started splitting off within the city. And people would travel for three hours by bus to get to church. They'd go to church, they'd just stay the day, they'd have lunch with everybody in the ward, and then at night they'd catch another bus three hours back to where they were living. And that was kind of like the early history of Interlagos. At this point, there are, I believe, seven stakes in the Interlagos mission. There were when I left, at least. It's, pr it's probably growing. Interlagos grows really fast. It, I saw one of the wards that I was in split while I was there. Um, I had the privilege of opening San Lorenzo, which was a new branch. Um, it, just, it just keeps growing. There's so many people the church just kind of explodes there. Um, Sao Paulo is one of five missions in the actual city of Sao Paulo. There's Sao Paulo North, South, East, West, and Interlagos, which is kind of the southwest corner. About five of its stakes are in the actual city itself. One of the stakes is like the southern part of the city and then a couple of the satellite sort of towns that are underneath it. Um, and another stake has two satellite towns, no, I guess it would be four satellite towns when you count Embudas Archis, Itapich, no, Itapichirica, sorry, San Lorenzo and Jucachiba. And that's kind of the most spread out of the stakes. In terms of going to church, when you're in the city, um, it really varies. It could be anywhere from a ward that's struggling to get 70 members to a ward that's got 300 or so and it just depends on where they are in their progression how they're doing in terms of uh, the key indicators worthy priesthood holders you know tithe payers things like that before they split but in general the people in brazil love to grow the church the leaders in brazil though so if you if you arrive to them with an idea and say hey you know if we get a certain more number of families then we could probably split this ward any bishop or any stake president will be absolutely thrilled with that. They'll love it. They'll say, all right, what do we, you know, what do we need to do? And they'll get all excited. And so it's, it's, it's a lot of growth. And because of that, things vary. I mean, you can have a lot of baptisms in an area and your frequency will, will go up because of that. But if some of them go inactive, it'll go down. I was in a ward where I think the max frequency I saw was slightly over 200 and the minimum I saw was about 60 one Sunday. So it just jumps back and forth. The real challenge is stability, is keeping people active and, and helping them to really feel like they're part of the church. 
and not just kind of that they entered into it and and they're completely alone. The church is pretty well thought of down there. Uh, people usually like and respect the members of the church, even if they don't agree with them. Um, there used to be some rumors, you know, about the church, like there are in any country. And so you still get some people who have just sort of heard about the Mormons, you know, that they sacrifice babies or whatever. There are lots of strange things. But mostly people are either Catholic or evangelical Christians. Um, the Catholics, if they're Catholic, they're not all that solid in their religion, but they don't want to change. They're, they're very... They're very firm. Um, the evangelical Christians are very solid in their religion, and they don't want to change either, because <laughs> to them it's they they take very personally the fact that you know if something doesn't agree with their doctrine, then they might be wrong. So they'll come, they'll let you in, they'll listen to you. They recognize to some extent that you're servants of God, but they think that everyone's servants of God. You know, if a homeless man came up and said, "I've got a message for you from God," they'd let him in and and listen to him just the same. So. Other than that, there's there's Seventh Day Adventists, which are, are very very strong in their religion. There are the Jehovah's Witnesses, which are also very strong in their religion. Um, there's Spiritism. I'm not sure how to how that translates. There's Spiritism. You find that kind of in the wealthier areas sometimes. It's kind of a mixture of philosophy and religion, and there. They're a little harder because they don't believe in absolute truth or absolute yes or no. It's all very fuzzy to them. But I mean, same with anyone. As soon as someone's touched by the spirit, you know, they have to respond to that. Or when they respond to that, I should say. They, they really understand what their purpose is. And, and if they're willing to commit to that purpose, if they're willing to understand that that response from God and and take it as a response from God, then, you know, they're 100%. Whenever I saw someone understand and apply an answer from God, it was like that moment where they, they admitted that they had received an answer, they recognized it as an answer, and they recognized that it was their duty to follow it. Because from then on, you could just tell that their life was going in an upward in an upward motion. So I think, I mean, I don't know if it's any one experience, but just seeing people make that decision to change their lives was probably the most special thing in the world. Let's see, I've said it, millions of missionaries have said it, it's very easy to say, to tell people that their family can be salad forever. It's just, you know, it's very, it's very easy to mix up the two words. And there were times when the rain just kind of fell and fell and fell and fell and all of the road was a lake and you either could try and dodge around it or step in the shallow parts or just walk through it and i ended up just walking through it because there was you know there's nothing else you can do if you're caught in a torrent you just get wet and you keep going uh, pig intestine the it's a delicacy in the northeast and my companion begged one of the members to make it for us and she made it and he shared it with me and then I found out what it was and and I felt really sick. <laughs> I had a lot of these but um, I was on a bus going going home at night and uh, a lady on the bus, it was it was packed, you know, as all the buses are, a lady on the bus accused the man next to her of improperly touching her and it got to the point where she pulled a fork out of her purse and started trying to stab him and they stopped the bus and like seven guys ran out with him and just like started beating him up outside. I was completely unprepared for it. Probably the value of consecration. Probably the necessity of giving our lives to God. Even after the mission, in everything we do, just dedicating ourselves completely to his service and not thinking about ourselves. I learned a lot of coin tricks, actually, just because, you know, it was good to help amuse people, amuse, especially little kids, like when you're teaching a family and, you know, the kids are kind of playing with your pamphlets and playing with you and, and looking at this big stranger, 
you know, you can always pull out a coin and just do some sort of magic and, and they'll, they'll be so astounded that they'll listen to you forever. Um, other than that, I learned to eat fast. I can eat, you know, if I want to, I can eat a meal in like five minutes and get it done. Nice. It's very easy to say, oh, I'm tired. It's very easy to make an excuse for not working as hard as you can and say, oh, you know, well, maybe we could take a break. Maybe we could, you know, just sort of chill out for a while. Or it's easy to be satisfied when you, you've you been doing a good day and it's, you know, it's eight o'clock and you've still got an hour, but you're like, eh, today was good. I think we could call it a night. But once you learn diligence, you know, it, it took a very a very honest and dear companion of mine telling me, listen, I just think you can give more. And that hurt, honestly, when he said that. But once he did say that, I rededicated myself and I decided that I was going to give my all. And from there on out, every day was a joy. Every day was, was the best thing ever because you just wiped yourself out in the service of the Lord. And the next day you woke up and you did it again. Um, probably the most important thing is to keep yourself busy. Because if you have nothing to do, then you're not productive. But keep yourself busy. Maintain your standards. A lot of missionaries come home and they're like, oh, I'm home. I can do all the things that I couldn't do on the mission. And I mean, that's true to a certain extent. But if you fall back into the same person you were before your mission, then your mission's not going to do you much good. I mean, the mission is about the people you serve, but at the same time, it's about your own conversion. So keeping yourself busy, maintaining your standards, and knowing that you can make mistakes. You know, every missionary wants to be perfect when he gets home. And if he makes a mistake in something, it feels terrible. He or she, I should say. Missionaries, you know, in general, you feel terrible because you've been, you've been on such a high level for two years and then you come back and you, you do something stupid and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. But it's okay. It's very normal. And, you know, Repentance applies to you just as much as it applied to your investigators, just as much as it applied to you before the mission. It's, there's no reason not to be happy. It's rice and beans all day and every day. I mean, it's rice and beans for lunch, for dinner, if you have dinner. Um, but anytime you go to a member's house, they will give you rice, beans, some sort of meat, probably a salad, and, uh, and soda. That's kind of the standard. I mean, there are variations from that. It's not a hard and fast rule, but you'll always have rice and beans. And then beyond that, it's kind of to the member's creativity. Um, but you'll, you'll grow to love it. I mean, it's good food. It, it might get monotonous after a while, but thankfully the variation in the other things can make up for it. Um, there's a soda that every Brazilian missionary talks about called Guarana. It's, it's pretty delicious. I mean, it comes from a berry that we don't have here, the Guarana berry, and it's a great way to get cavities. It's a great way to ruin your teeth just because it's so easy to drink so much of it. But there are, you know, endless variations of Guarana. I think there's about seven major brands of Guarana and, you know, ten minor ones. Probably the best meals, the actual meals uh, that I had. I had a lot of fried chicken. They, it's, it's easy, it's cheap, you know, it's good stuff. But the best meals I had were feijoada, which is like a black bean stew with every piece of the pork you can imagine put into it. You know, if you're, if you get someone who's from the Northeast, like traditional Northeast, you might find an ear or a hoof or something floating in it. It's normal. Don't worry about it. Just eat it and, and ignore it. <laughs> but it's really delicious. It's really easy to get full on. Uh, and you always just keep eating more. There's also something called pudon, which is like, I'm not sure how to describe it. Uh, they take like the juice of meat, the meat juice, I guess that's a better way to say it. They take meat juice and they mix it in with a type of tapioca flour. It's called, actually it's called manioc flour. They're, they're made from the same root, but they're slightly different in the way they're produced. And they make it into this paste. And I don't know why, but it's delicious. I mean, it's just this like meat paste and you stick it on top of your rice and beans and you mix it in with everything and you eat it. It's just so good. It, that one's a lot, that one's really easy to eat as well. 
just to keep eating and not stop. Um, but the desserts are where you're going to get in trouble if you have to walk a lot that day. There's Pujim, Pujim Jilech, which is like, I think it's, I think they call it flan here. I don't know. It's like a little, it's like a little flan with syrup drizzled on it. And it's, it's wonderful. It's rich. It's creamy. It's eggy. It's everything you'd ever want. Um, they also have mousse, moussey, which is like mousse, and, but they make it out of fruit usually. So you'll have uh, passion fruit mousse, you'll have strawberry mousse, you'll have lemon mousse, lime mousse. The distinction between lemon and lime in Brazil is very thin if non-existent. It's pretty much the same fruit. Like if you try and tell someone about a, a, a lemon, they'll just be like, oh yeah, it's a lime. Like, well, it's not a lime, it's, it's kind of a yellow lime. All right, so it's a lime. <laughs> oh well, but they make lots of mousse out of that. Brazilians also love stroganoff, and it's a classic meal to give to the missionaries. And it's just, you know, bits of meat in a nice creamy sauce, and you put it on top of the rice. You can have beans with it, but it's kind of, kind of strange. And then they'll put little shoestring potatoes on top of it. It's fantastic. It, it was always my favorite day whenever there was stroganoff, because it's just so good. And it fills you up so well. It's easy to make, too. Sao Paulo's dangerous. <laughs> it's just, it's a big city. And Sao Paulo Interlagos isn't the nicest of the, the parts of the city, we should say. But even in the nicer parts, there's crime. Um, there's a lot of gangs. There's a lot of drugs going on. There are, you'll see people with weapons. Although you don't really want to call attention to it. But as a missionary, you're safe. You're, you're very well protected. If you're following the rules and if you're not doing anything foolish, you're going to be pretty well protected. Um, if you do get robbed, you know, they tell you in the MTC, they tell you in general, just give them any money that you have. Don't try and resist. Usually they're armed and pretty dangerous people. Um, they'll ask you for your cell phone which isn't really a problem if you get robbed and you give them your cell phone, but you can ask for the SIM card back, which is the important thing because they will give it to you. <laughs> sometimes, I should say sometimes. But there have been some missionaries, there were some missionaries who got robbed, I'd say like a couple times within a couple weeks. And every time they just, they just say, hey, can I have the SIM card? And the, <laughs> the robber would actually pause, open up the cell phone, pull out the battery, pull out the SIM card, give it back to him and then leave. So, I mean, it's, it's just desperate people needing money, and they'll get more desperate if you don't have money. But in general, you're safe. I mean, there's not really safe areas for the sisters to be in. You know, it's not like they can really separate the sisters into safer areas, but sisters don't really have problems down there. Uh, if they do, then Heavenly Father protects them. I mean... There were so many times when things just worked out, you know. There was one time when we were out late teaching, and it was about 9, and you can be back by 9.30 if you're out teaching. But we knew it was going to be tight. We knew that we were going to have to book it all the way home. And we were just feeling really nervous about the night in general. I, I did not feel good. When we got outside, I was ready to start knocking on people's doors and ask if we could use their phone to call a member and get a ride. Because I just, I didn't feel good. Our phone was out of, out of uh, credits, minutes. Our phone was out of minutes. And sort of right as we walked outside and we were trying to decide what to do, a member just up and called us and said, Hey, elders, I was just driving home. Do you need anything? And we hadn't, we hadn't told him or anything that we'd be out teaching late. He had just decided to call. He, he felt the spirit basically telling, telling him that we needed him. And he answered that call. And we were very grateful because we said, yeah, could you come and pick us up right now and take us home? And he said, sure thing. And he came by and, and grabbed us. Um, I don't know why that particular night it was not safe. I don't know what was out there. All I know is that we didn't have to run into it. And I mean... You'll be protected. There, there are countless times when, when I felt like I was in danger, but for one reason or another, the danger just stopped, or it was taken care of by someone else. So, 
danger exists in Sao Paulo, but as a missionary, you're free from it. In terms of weather, Sao Paulo is either really hot or it's pouring. And, and it's actually, it's hot while it's pouring too, but it's either really hot without rain or it's really hot with rain. And when it rains, it rains. It rains upwards, downwards, and sideways. I think I went through like four umbrellas and with about six months left, I just stopped buying umbrellas. I would just walk through the rain because I was going to get wet anyway. It was fun. Uh, when it gets hot, it gets hot. I mean, it's Brazil. I, if you think you're not going to sweat, sorry, <laughs> you're going to have to sweat. I mean, you get sweaty, you walk all the day, all, all day, you walk all day long, you walk from appointment to appointment. It's, it's really actually quite easy to get across the city with public transportation, uh, but it's full. It is very, very full. Buses, you'll be pressed up against other people. You'll be crowded, especially when everyone's coming home from work at night or early in morning. Everyone just kind of shoves in. And if you're lucky, you'll get a seat. And if you're not, you'll be standing in the aisle and you'll have people on either side of you, right next to you, pushing into you, people behind you. It's tight. Um, the trains in the subway are even worse. Uh, if you get on a train during like the morning hours when people are going to work, it gets so bad that literally half the people have to breathe in while the other half are breathing out. It's just that packed. And if you drop something, you can say goodbye to it. <laughs> Uh, not that anyone will steal it, it's just that you won't be able to bend down to pick it up. It's it's nigh into impossible. Um, but it's fun. I, I really enjoyed using the buses and the train and the subway just because it was so different. I mean, in, in Colorado everyone has a car, in Provo everyone has a car, in the United States everyone has a car. There are a lot of cars in Sao Paulo, uh, so the streets are usually packed. And so if you hit bad traffic, you could be stuck there for an extra hour, two hours, three hours just depending on how long it takes for things to clear up. But it's it's a good system. I mean, honestly, if I, if I had to go to the hospital in an ambulance, I think I would prefer to take the train or the bus over the ambulance because the train or the bus gets through traffic faster than an ambulance does. But other than that, it's, it's easy. It's easy to get around. Okay. Sao Paulo sort of the inner city is like the actual the the rich part of the city which not part of not much of Interlagos covers but it covers a little bit but most of it's pretty flat um as you spread out to the outer reaches it's all built on hills so you'll be walking up hills that are gigantic i mean not really in size but just in in turning or in what is that called incline um Everything's built on hills there. So you'll be walking up hills and down hills and over hills and and not really under hills, but you 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 end up you end up working a lot, I should say. You end up walking a lot. In terms of housing, it's it, it's what they call favela. It's it's mostly red brick, cement, and paint. <laughs> If you're lucky for missionaries the houses are, are well inspected they do have standards so you won't be living in a hole or anything but it'll be different I mean the showers instead of having hot water and cold water the showers just have a little a little shower head that plugs into the wall and heats up the water for you in the morning and you kind of have to fiddle with it to get the right temperature washing machines are pretty common dryers don't exist <laughs> So you're going to stretch everything out on a clothesline, and that's fun. I mean, it's a new experience. You certainly learn from it, especially especially if you have to wash something at night and have to have it dry by the morning. You usually end up putting a fan or something outside to make sure that it's dry. Well, Interlagos is not the wealthiest of the missions in the world. So mostly jobs are stonemasons, construction worker, um, cleaning lady, nanny, just kind of the low, the low income, low education sort of jobs that you get. Um, the church headquarters for the area of Brazil is based in Sao Paulo. So you do get some members who work for the church. Um, big businesses. There are some big businesses, but they're more towards the center. And that's really a little too far away. I shouldn't say too far away. It's, it's pretty far from where our mission is. 
And so if someone does work there, they, they travel a long time and, or they tend to live in the richer parts of the city. Living in Sao Paulo, um, if you're renting, uh, a place to rent can cost anywhere from 200 reais. Okay, just before we, you know, before we get into the numbers, uh, they work with the Brazilian real there. And when I was there, it was about two reais to a dollar. Um, it might be closer to three with the way the dollar's been going recently, but uh, apartments were anywhere from 200 reais to, I mean, obviously there's no upper bound, but a thousand reais would be possible per month, uh, and that would be in the really, really nice places or in the older parts of the city. Um, food's cheap. Food's very cheap. Um... Especially, especially fruit. I mean, they have it in such abundance that, you know, they have, uh, they have fruit markets around and you can just walk in and, and buy as much fruit as, as you really want to. But food itself, as a missionary, you're probably not going to spend more than 50 to 60 reais a month on food. That's probably conservative. I didn't eat as much as a lot of other missionaries did, but... You know, 60 to 80, let's say, would be a solid, a solid budget for food. Uh, electronics are horridly expensive. They're three to four times what you would pay in the United States. And they're not always as good a quality. Um, just sort of as an example, obviously you're not going to be buying any of this on your mission, but I think it was the PlayStation 4 or something came out while I was on my mission. I think it was like 6,000 hey eyes. It's like 3,000 bucks new and it was just it was ridiculous i mean i couldn't imagine i think i heard a news story where like about a month after it had come out only two brazilians had actually bought one in brazil because <laughs> no one wants to spend that kind of money on electronics but at the same time everyone has a tv not the missionaries but everyone all the members you know every house that you visit will have a very large flat screen tv and they'll be paying it off for months. I mean, interest kills Brazilians because to them it's great. You can, you know, you can pay a little bit now and just keep paying in the future and and they end up paying a lot. They end up losing a lot of their money to interest because they want things kind of in the moment and end up in debt. Uh, Transportation. Uh, usually you're going to walk, but if you're, if you're going to a meeting, you're probably going to use most likely a bus um, possibly also a train or the, the subway. And that's also really cheap. To get on the bus is three hay eyes. There we go. The, to get on the bus is three hay eyes. If you have a little card, it's called the Bilhete Unico, but if you have that little card, you can, you know, you can swipe your card to the reader. And then for three hours, you can ride any bus for free after that up to four times. And so um, if you need to get to a long place in kind of a short amount of time, you can snag a bus, go over there and snag a bus back as long as it's within that time frame. And you'll only, you know, you'll only pay three hay eyes. The train's also three hay eyes. There's also some sort of deal where if you get on a train and a bus in the same amount of time, it's discounted. I don't know how that worked. I never figured it out. Uh, and the subway's the same. San Lorenzo was my, my last transfer. And we got sent out there to, to open up a branch there, technically a group off of a, another branch. Um, and it was, it was entirely different from the rest of the mission. I mean, it still isn't that wealthy, but it's out kind of, they, they say out in the grass. I mean, there's trees everywhere. It's kind of that South American, not forest, cause it's not a jungle, but south american land it was, it was all different i mean it was so green it was so beautiful it was it was two and a half hours from the office by bus and it was it was a long trip to get to get to meetings and such but it was probably one of my favorite areas just because the people there were a lot more calm relaxed in sao paulo everyone's very very agitated they're not agitated that's kind of the wrong word it has negative connotation but they they want to get where they're going they're busy they have things to do you know they keep a schedule they get up at five and they go to bed at 12 and they're working most of that time 
but in San Lorenzo, people are more are more happy, are more sort of they take life slower, and it's a tiny town. I mean, the actual city itself, like the the main city, has about four or five roads, and all of it is just sort of you know the the houses that have been built surrounding it. That's that's probably the only yeah that's probably the only area where people had like yards and a lot of space around their house. There weren't that many members in San Lorenzo. It's doing great now. Like they're, they have great frequency. But when I was there, I think there were two members families that were active, two or three. And so every Sunday we would have lunch at their house, uh, one of those houses. And then the rest of the week, the mission just gave us money to eat at a little cafe that was there because there wasn't really anyone else. Um, so references were a little tough there, you know, because no one knew anyone else. But a bunch of people receptive to the gospel, happy to be alive, and just just calm and peaceful. It was a great place to end the mission because it kind of put that sort of relaxing cap on everything. So Portuguese is pretty similar to Spanish. It's it's like a nasalized Spanish. Spanish speakers speak a lot, you know, right in front of their mouth. Portuguese speakers speak a lot through their nose. You know, São Paulo, it's got a lot of those sounds. Um, but in general, I found it pretty easy to learn. I mean, I studied a little bit of Spanish in high school, but not enough to actually know anything. Um, but Portuguese came pretty easily. Uh, it takes some people longer, it takes some people shorter, but if you just study, you'll pick it up pretty fast. Um, in terms of grammar, the Portuguese they teach you in the MTC is very correct, is very, it's very proper. The Portuguese you speak in Sao Paulo is not. So you'll learn one thing in the MTC and then you'll see how people have changed it when you get into Sao Paulo. Um, it's not too bad, it's not like they change conjugations that much, but there are little things that you'll have to pick up on. Um, there's a lot of slang in Sao Paulo, so it's very hard to it's very hard to understand some people because they just speak in complete slang. They'll call you mano brother, and you're like, I don't even know what that means. And most of them are just sort of constructs from English that they've pulled over. In general, if you just ask someone, they'll tell you what something means. You know, it's not it's not a bad thing or anything. So. There's a lot of opportunity to learn. You know, you can just say, you know, what does this mean? Or how do you use this? Or could you explain, how, you know, why you use this? And people will tell you pretty well. Um, some of the Brazilians also speak incorrectly, which makes it a little harder. And so they'll use conjugations wrong. They'll sort of use words incorrectly or they'll change them incorrectly. And so when you come from the MTC, you're expecting everything to follow the same pattern. You're expecting everything to fit into the rules that you learned. And you're going to have to be flexible. You're going to have to understand that these people are speaking Portuguese. They're just speaking it incorrectly, but that's how they know it. You know, that's their Portuguese. It's Brazilian Portuguese. So other than that, it's pretty simple. I mean, it, it, it shouldn't be a problem for any missionary going there. Ask questions and try and use Portuguese as much as possible. I mean, I know it's kind of cheesy classic answer, but actively try and learn. Listen to what people are saying. It's very easy in that first transfer or so to just tune out what people are saying. Because you don't understand, you can't speak it anyway, so it doesn't matter. But if you really try and listen, and you, you try and hear what words they're using, and if you can remember them or write them down, then later you can turn to your companion or to someone else who lives in the same house and say, hey, I heard this earlier what in the world were they saying? Or if you can just leave a lesson and tell your companion, I didn't even understand them, they'll probably tell you that they had some sort of accent. Accents are really strange in Portuguese. Um, so like the word door in the Northeast, it's like porta. Uh, if you go to Sao Paulo, it's porta. If you go to Rio, it's porta. It, it's, there's just such a smattering of accents that it's kind of hard to hear. Uh, it's kind of hard to hear the same word from a different accent. But once you get a handle on Portuguese, 
like the actual, you know, the language itself, then you'll be able to get a handle on accents pretty easily. And you'll have a lot of Brazilian companions, so you'll have a lot of experience with how some people speak versus how other people speak. So in English, um, we tend to say our T's and D's very strongly, you know, that, or, you know, tap. It's a very percussive sound. But in Portuguese, they're a lot sort of, uh, they're muffled sort of with your tongue. And we tend to, to give a lot of diphthongs to our vowels. So, and in Portuguese, you know, a vowel is a vowel. So if I were to say, I'm a missionary of the Church of Jesus Christ, you know, a greenie might speak very slow and they'd say, you know, eu sou um missionário da igreja de Jesus Cristo dos santos dos últimos dias. And that would actually be pretty good for a greenie, honestly, because that would mean they remembered all of the, the little intricacies and of the DEs and DIs. But um, once you start speaking faster, you're going to pay attention to your vowels, you're going to speak a little more with your nose, and you're going to understand kind of the differences in T's and D's. You're going to say, Eu sou um missionário da Igreja de Jesus Cristo dos Santos dos últimos dias. And it's very, it's very smooth, it's very sort of mellow, um, and a lot of it has to do with the nose. <laughs> if you can understand when to speak with your nose and when not, you'll be miles ahead of any other missionary in speaking Portuguese. To say a prayer, you're going to start with Heavenly Father, which in Portuguese is Pai Celestial. Um, and then you're going to say, you know, I'm grateful for, so grato por, or if you're a girl, it's so grata por. Um, and then you can say for this day, you know, por este dia, I'm grateful for Jesus Christ, so grato por Jesus Cristo. I'm grateful to be a missionary. Eu sou grato por ser um missionário. Uh, then after that, you know, you say, please bless us. And you can say, por favor, nos abençoa. Or um, you can say, peço que nos abençoe. Abençoes, pardon. If you say, peço que nos abençoes, that's like, I ask that, that thou blessest us. Um, and then after that, you know, whatever you need, you, know, you can say, pelo espírito, you know, or como espírito. So it'd be... Uh, por favor, no saben soy como espíritu. That would be with the spirit. No saben soy uh, com caridade, with charity. No saben soy. This will be a little complex, but that we can find people to teach. Que nos possamos achar pessoas para ensinar. Um, and then when you're done, you say, Em nome de Jesus Cristo, amém. And that's in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Everyone tells you before your mission that you should love the people, and that's true, obviously, but I think because of the kind of how English language works, there's an ambiguity on whether you should love the people as a whole or individual people. And I think the key to being a successful missionary is loving individual people, loving everyone you come in contact with, including your companions, including your leaders, and understanding that the only way anything in the gospel functions is through love you know, through gentle persuasion. So love the people, but love each person, I think would be probably the most important thing on the mission. The mission will be the best thing in your life. It will literally change how you think of the world, how you think of what you do, how you treat others. It will, it will change you from the inside out. I think the most important thing is just to understand that you're in God's service and to understand that you're a representative of Jesus Christ. And if you do that, and if you work every day with that in mind, you know, you won't have to worry about how you're changing. The change will happen. It'll happen automatically. Uh, I loved, I loved my mission. I loved every minute of it. Um, there are a lot of things that I could have done better. I think everyone, you know, no one knows how to be a missionary until they're a missionary. So obviously, there are going to be times when you think, oh, I could have done that better, but it's part of learning. And nothing can compare with... The mission won't be the best two years of your life, but it'll be the best two years for your life. It'll change how, how you interact, how you serve in your callings. 
how you treat other people. I think I already said that. But especially in São Paulo Interlagos, you'll learn how to be obedient. You will learn how to consecrate yourself. And you'll learn what's important. You'll learn really what the Lord wants of you, both during the mission and for the rest of your life. You'll love it.